Shall we start? Yes, please go ahead. Were there any people who triggered your thinking about extraterrestrials? No, I I I I worked on other, in other areas of astronomy before, and uh, I was just driven into this subject over the past since 2017, mainly uh, as a result of Oumuamua. But uh, even before that, um, you know, I started getting interested in the subject of the search for life, both primitive life and intelligent life, and and uh, just learned it for myself and wrote a lot of papers on it. You know, by now. Uh, more than a hundred papers on this subject. And um, I find this subject fascinating just because it's uh, the most important question that will have the biggest impact on society in science, in my opinion. Yet at the same time, it's underfunded, you know, compared to other uh, research programs. Just to give you an example, you know, the there is a search for dark matter, which is most of the matter in the universe. We don't know what it is. We give it a label dark matter. And there are, there were various types of particles that were proposed as the dark matter in the universe. And there were searches for them at the, that were funded at hundreds of millions of dollars. And nothing was found. Of course, you know, whenever you work at the frontiers, there is a risk that you will not uh, discover something. And, and that's acceptable. You know, that that's part of the mainstream and that's fine but at the same time the search for technological signatures of things like us is funded at the federal level by a factor of a thousand less and you ask yourself how is that possible because if we understand that dark matter is an axion or a weakly interacting massive particles you know that will have zero impact on our daily life but if we find that Oumuamua was a technological relic that would have a huge impact on society uh, what is the reason for su such a prevailing conservatism in the national sciences? Well, so that's that's an excellent question. So one, there are several aspects to it. One is the desire of the academic community to distinguish itself, to elevate itself above the public. And the fact that there is science fiction and um, reports about unidentified flying objects that are not up to the scientific standards. And... Uh, um, <clears throat> So first of all, I don't think that science should be elevated. I think science should be um, a way of life, you know, that it should be available for the public to understand even when most of the most of the time science is work in progress. You know, we don't have enough evidence to decide between different interpretations. That's what most of the time we are we are facing. And the, the public should understand that, that science is not certain, that there are various possibilities and we, until we have enough evidence we are not sure about because that's the usual experience. You know, when you have a problem with the, uh, the the pipe at home, you know, like in the basement, you're trying to figure out with a plumber what the problem is. Then there are often multiple interpret multiple reasons that could explain it, and then you try to find more clues, and eventually you hone on the right explanation and you f fix it. So it's exactly the same way in science. It's a matter of common sense finding the right answer based on evidence guided by. It being guided. By. And if the public understands it, there is nothing wrong about multiple interpretations when the evidence is not clear cut. And uh, many of my, my colleagues say, no, 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 we should never discuss it with the public until we are absolutely sure about the ex explanation. And the problem with that is you arrange, you arrange a, a public announcement. And then a few months later, it turns out that some of the assumptions that were made in that public announcement are wrong. And then you have to retract it. And it looks completely unhealthy. Also, it looks as if you are a lecturer in a class to student, and the public is students, and they should accept whatever you feed them. And that is not the right attitude. And especially on a subject like the search for technological signatures, which is of great interest to the public, there is an obligation to attend to that because the public funds science. So I think that science should be communicated to the public as an equal. You know, the public is supposed to understand how science is done, not supposed to just be lectured at. And um, so that's problem number one right now in the culture. The second is that many of uh, the scientists are driven by the ambition to demonstrate that they are smart. So <clears throat> that may sound okay, that's legitimate, you know, but at the same time, it drives some culture, you know, communities of mainstream scientists to work on things that have no experimental verification. Because if you put some skin in the game and test yourself, then there is a chance you will be wrong. 
And so if you don't want to be wrong, you want to show that you are smart always, you go to a corner that can never be tested experimentally. You do string theory. You, you work on extra dimensions. You work on the multiverse. These are concepts of the mainstream that can never be tested, at least until now, and maybe not in the next decades throughout their careers. And that's very comfortable because then you can do mathematical gymnastics and show that you are smart. It's a sandbox that allows you to do that. But I regard those as much more speculative than talking about technological signature. And finally, I wanted to mention that <clears> there <throat> are people saying, oh, it's a controversial subject. But the point is, if you go back in ancient history, you will find discussions about the human body having a soul. And that's why anatomy should not be pursued. And um, imagine if scientists would say, oh, the, there is this controversy about whether the human body has a soul or doesn't have a soul. We don't want to deal with that. Where would modern medicine be? You know, I think science has an obligation to address a, a, any subject that is of great significance to the public uh, and clear it up using the scientific method. That's an obligation. It's not an option. It's not something you can say, oh, I don't like this subject. I brush it to the side. Uh, if the public cares about it and you have the tools to address it, you must do that. And by the way, if you do that, you will get more funded. So I just don't understand the current psychology, the current uh, atmosphere that we were talking about. The German science journalist Rüdiger Faust says that paleoceti are pre-astronautics, uh, which says that our planet was visited by extraterrestrials who intervened in humanity's evolution a long time ago, is a legitimate part of Zeta. What do you think about this hypothesis? Well, I think it's unlikely that uh, we are of sufficient interest to, for, for someone else to visit us. You know, when I, I met uh, my, my wife, uh, she had a lot of friends that were waiting for Prince Charming on a white horse to come over and make them a marriage proposal, and it never happened. I think it's presumptuous of us to think that we are that important and interesting for someone to visit us, because, um, you know, most likely there were billions of things like us in history uh, of the Milky Way galaxy, because most of the stars formed billions, billions of years before the sun. And um, uh, and so it, we are just like ants on a sidewalk, you know, they, we are one out of many. And I don't think that we are that intelligent. We only developed uh, technologies over the past uh, century or so. And before that, we were pretty uninteresting, you know, if you look at human history. Um, so I don't think anyone came here or will show interest unless, of course, we send out signals uh, without uh, being careful, you know, and then there is the risk of a predator coming to visit us. We already sent out for a century radio signals and it's possible they detected it already within 100 light years. But if they use uh, 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 chemical rockets like we used in Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons, it will take them a million years to traverse 100 light years. So uh, we still have time, but uh, but we were not careful. The hypothesis I'm, I mentioned uh, was made popular by Erich von Dänigen in 1968. That's right. Uh, yes. have, have you read any of his books? No, I didn't. Uh, but I did get uh, his best regards uh, through a journalist. Uh, he's still alive. And uh, also, he was quoted in a New Yorker uh, piece about my book, a review of my book. Uh, he was asked about it, and he was very supportive. Um, I didn't, uh, as a child, you know, his book appeared when I was very young, and, um, uh, you know, it, it was controversial at the time, the, the claim that they visited, or uh, that there is some evidence. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, there is no... Um, scientific data that directly indicates uh, that validates his views you know although it's it's possible but uh, so I haven't you know I, I've been focusing mostly on on scientific research in in recent decades so I haven't I haven't read the book uh, what uh, contribution has he made to the search for extraterrestrial well, I think any discussion of his type or of science fiction, even though it's not rooted in scientific evidence necessarily, uh, is important in the sense that it expands our imagination. You know, so very often in science, you have to imagine things before you discover them. 
because otherwise you're not searching for the right things. Just to give you an example, um, uh, astronomers, uh, you know, when I was a postdoc uh, several decades ago, and um, it turns out I, I, someone showed me uh, images in the astrophysical journal that had the giant arcs around clusters of galaxies, and, and people just ignored them. They just saw these arcs and didn't make much of them and said, oh, maybe it's an artifact. We don't know what it is. They didn't care about it. Then uh, in the 1980s, it became fashionable to discuss gravitational lensing. And uh, suddenly people said, oh, well, maybe we can explain these arcs as lensed images, um, stretched up images of background galaxies. That, uh, and then it became a whole frontier called gravitational lensing of background galaxies by clusters of galaxies that stand in front of them. So the force of gravity bends the light rays that come from the background source, and then you get stretching of uh, the background source into an arc, which you, is beautiful. You know, you can find things that are very far away. This, so you are using a, a, a natural lens, lens that nature provided us with. Uh, anyway, this is just to show that you know you could have facts in front of you, like these arcs in the images that were published. Uh, but if you are, if you don't have the imagination, if you don't realize that oh, there could be something like gravitational lensing, you would never recognize it. So uh, data is not enough. That's the point. And 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 the importance of these books is that it expands our imagination, and therefore we might find things that otherwise we wouldn't imagine. That leads to my next question. In 2017, the New York Times published three UFO videos, which were offic officially released by the Pentagon in 2020. Uh, so far, there's no clear answer uh, to the question of what these objects are about. Could it be possible that we are already being visited by aliens and just don't want to accept it? Well, of course it's possible. I mean, but uh, we should rely on evidence. And on that, my point is that we shouldn't um, obsess with uh, old reports uh, that were classified. I mean, they were classified because there was a question of whether they are of national uh, security importance, you know, because, for example, if the Soviets or the Chinese have uh, equipment that is spying on the U.S., the U.S. government wants to know about it. So uh, at first you want to examine the, these unidentified objects and try to figure out if they are related to espionage or some other reason that other nations are do, uh, using technologies that the, U the U.S. government is not aware of. You know, that's the first. And that's why it would be classified. Uh, it's not because it could be an alien civilization. It's because it could be some, some other nation, okay, on Earth. Uh, but um, I think that instead of obsessing with those reports, which were obtained either by eyewitness testimonies or by equipment that is old by today's standards, you know. So nowadays we have cameras that are far better. We have audio recording devices far better than we used to have. And I think that the best path forward to figure out if UFOs make sense is to deploy the best equipment uh, in those uh, sites, you know, in those geographical locations where the reports came from and try to collect as much data as possible scientifically. And then, um, in an open way and see if there is anything unusual. I think that's the way to do it. And I think, you know, it wouldn't cost too much. You, you need uh, funding at the level of tens of millions of dollars to do this. And uh, instead of obsessing with old reports that were done by equipment that was not optimized for this purpose, we should just check out, you know, why not? Just place those best, uh, you know, state-of-the-art cameras and uh, audio recorders and, and see what they they record. Uh, you know, it reminds me of this uh, uh, biblical story about Abraham that, uh, according to the biblical story, was uh, heard the voice of God telling him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And uh, if Abraham had a cell phone with a voice memo up, he, he could have pressed the button and recorded the voice of God. And then all of us would believe the story. But instead, we have to rely on eyewitness testimony in a biblical story, and you either believe it or not. That's not uh, the scientific approach. Scientific approach is things must be reproducible. Okay, so you need to be able to reproduce the evidence somehow. And and the best way to do it with UFOs would be to, to put these devices in the same locations. 
Professor Loeb, uh, thank you for the conversation. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.